So that's 12 rounds of MotoGP done and dusted for 2024. Uh, we've been to Aragon now, which looks like a nice place nestled up there in north of Spain. Looks like a nice little area, cool little town they've got there, a couple of castles on the hill and all that. I'd like to go to this one. Cool circuit. I really like the layout. I always have really liked the layout. It's got a bit of everything, this one. It's got the elevation change, the cool wall section, combination of really tight technical stuff and, and big sweeping corners, nice long straight. Got a bit of everything, this one. Cool circuit. But it has also thrown up one of the most, I think, interesting and almost chaotic weekends of the year. It's just certainly one of the most interesting weekends of the year, for sure. A bit of a crazy one. And we're going to go over everything right now. So we're going to go over Mark Marquez, uh, a bit of a return to form for Acosta and KTM in general, uh, a bit of a surprise in the All Japan Cup this week, as well as we're definitely going to, we're going to go right into the um, Alex marquez Peco incident. And like always, we'll cover Moto2 and Moto3, everything Everything is chaptered down below. If you want to skip ahead to the things that are important to you, just jump down there, scroll across to whatever it is you want to hear about. Uh, we're going to start in Moto3 just to switch things up this week because this was so interesting. We had tire issues and stuff like that with, with the circuit and the surface um, being a bit dirty and dusty. There was there was high wear on the tires. So we ended up bringing uh, Pirelli brought some tires that aren't normally available um some i get what are they called like a prototype tire or something like that a harder compound a few riders went for that can't remember who maybe ruader can't remember if he had it on or not but yeah it was a really interesting race they're all very well behaved through the first section and and alonso looked to check out um and this is an easy mistake to make when it's like this you, you try and check out you've got the pace you probably isn't pushing that hard but with the high tire wear scenario that we had it just meant that um, he was probably wearing through his tyres quicker than he thought he was for the pace he was doing. Because I don't think he was that close to his his best pace that he could do. Uh, but it just ate, ate into the tyres. And it was an interesting one because at any one point in the Grand Prix, there was a different guy leading the charge to, to, to catch him up. And all of them fell into the same sort of issue. So early on, it was uh, Kelso and Holgado who were doing the pacemaking in terms of that following group to try and chase chase down Alonso they fell away then we had Furusato come to the front he looked for all money like he was going to be able to close the gap with all his pace he fell away and then we had Colin Vaya lead the chase and then in the end he didn't fall away as bad as the others but he didn't quite he ended up catching obviously Alonso but he probably went a touch too early because it was Rueda who came through in the end to win the race very nice victory for him first Grand Prix victory if I'm not mistaken he ended up winning it quite comfortably in the end just the the timing of when he came through that's why i was thinking maybe he was the one that had the um that sort of that new tire on that that the one that's not normally in the allocation so maybe he was running that harder tire uh but he had good pace all weekend Rueda. so it made sense that he was going to have the right race pace and didn't didn't go too early didn't cook his tires too early he rode very measured um and just must have been confident the race was going to come to him at some point uh but the, yeah like i said via second and then luca lanetta completed the podium fantastic result for the young man. I think he's a rookie still, isn't he? So I've been impressed with him this year. Like I've not mentioned him, but he has been solid, solid enough. As good as any of the other rookies, really, when, you, when you're looking at it. He's, I probably have him a bit behind um, until this point. I probably had him a little bit behind the likes of, you know, Pekeras and, and Ralston maybe, but he has been there or thereabouts. He's been solid enough for a debut season and gets his just rewards this weekend. So really well done for him. And that team, you want to see a team with a 58, bike on you know you want to see him do well but david alonso misses the podium but it does still i, I think again he's extended his world championship lead because even otolo was just not at the races this weekend did he qualify poorly or did he get a yeah only qualified 10th and was never really there to make it up it didn't really work for him they were, they were all pretty well behaved it was just it was you don't get race like this in moto 3 very often so you did and while it wasn't as action-packed as usual it was very interesting in the way it played out the which riders came to the front and then fell away at different times just by going those few laps too early or pushing that little bit too hard and try and make up the ground to Alonso. And then Alonso himself obviously went too hard too early. So really interesting one. But yeah, you never really get them like this in Moto3. So when you get one, it's nice to just sit there and relax. You'd be like, oh, I'm just watching a normal race or whatever. Uh, so yeah, Moto2 now. And Jake Dixon is like the four man in the paddock at the moment. <laughs> Never thought I'd say that. After he won at Silverstone and then got another podium in Austria and then he's won again now in um, in Aragon. He's, um, the man to beat, isn't he? Is he still too far for me to do the 
job? I think so. But when you the thing that's giving encouragement to him and a lot of people and, will, and should do is the fact that the form of any of the front three or four has not been great. I mean, between Garcia, Agura, and Roberts, the form has been non-existent. It's brought Lopez back into it. And I've barely even thought about him, to be honest, in the last few weeks. He's just been solid. He's not done anything that great. That's what will give them and him and that team a lot of encouragement. In saying that, I, I think the Agura form thing, I don't necessarily think he's out of form. I think, obviously... In Austria, didn't race because of he fractured that bone in his hand or whatever it was. And he was, for all money, the quickest guy that weekend to that point. He's probably going to go on to win that race because you can never know that. But he was definitely had the pace to win it. And he was the four man. And if he didn't win it, I imagine he would have been on the podium. And then here, tough weekend. Maybe the injury's playing up a little bit. Maybe still a bit of pain or it's playing on his mind. Or maybe he just wasn't at the races this weekend. But produce what I'm going to call a bit of a champion's ride. If he goes on to win the championship this year, it's rides like this where you're like, he's actually recovered something there. He's actually recovered something. He's finished eighth. The difference between him this weekend and Garcia is that he was not in as bad a position as Garcia was nowhere near it, but he was in a bad position. He didn't panic. He just sat there and slowly just got the lap times right and just picked guys off one by one to the point where he ended up in the top 10 and picking up a good chunk of points in the end. Whereas though Garcia's was a full-on blowout, it was just a, he had to park it up in the end. There was just no point in him staying out there. Now, I know he may have had injury issues as well, so uh, with his shoulder. So that is a mitigating circumstance that we may not know the extent of. So we'll give him benefit of the doubt for that. But where what I mean is where Agura's had a weekend where he's like, good handful of points. I can take this on forward now. I'll be better next week and the week after as my injury gets a bit better. Garcia's is just a full blight. There's no points there for him. So in that sense, I think Agura can do this enough times where he just salvages something that I think Dixon is maybe too far back to catch up to him. And if Garcia then turns it back on again, we know how good he can be. He can go on and win races. So, But in saying that, if they are going to be finishing to the bottom, bottom part of the top 10 every single race and Dixon's going to be on the podium every race, then he will catch him up. So, you know, Penny for your thoughts there. Let me know what you think is going to happen. I still think he's a bit too far back. As good as his form's been, is he got a history of keeping form up? I don't know if it always lasts long, but it could be a new man at the moment. So you don't know. This could be a new man we're looking at. So he could be able to kick on. Now, this one, unlike Moto3, where they're all well behaved, was chaotic from the start. We had um, Guevara go down early. There was just weird shit happening. Canet got himself in all sorts of trouble. Uh, and ended up having a big high side, getting off the racing line onto the dirt. It just flicked him off down the hill and through that little corkscrew section. It was just all happening in this one. And then later on, I mean, the guys that we had running at the front are guys not normally always there. So Arbolino st- stuck with Dixon for a while till Dixon just thought, oh, you're done here, mate, and just kicked on. Onshu involved. Manu Gonzalez, Chantra end up sixth. Onshu was great. Almost got caught up with Fuminal de Guerre. Again, for all this talk of like, who should get what ride and... The way TNT went on the other week about Roberts not getting the thingy right and then him having another disaster this weekend. No one mentioned that Honda's taken Chantra when they could have taken Joe Roberts. Oh, no one had an issue with that one. Jesus Christ. No, they didn't think they mentioned that once from what I was watching. So anyway, this is a little bit of a me rambling on again about stuff that annoys me that shouldn't. But yeah, the Fermi Aldeguer one looked like, from that camera angle they have right above the inside of that corner, that went in slow motion for me. That was all happening. You could see from when he decided that he was going to make that move and he started to pull up in, on the inside of Onchu and I was like, oh God. Straight away I was like, oh no. It all went in slow motion from that. That camera angle makes it, because that's a slow corner, that camera angle, you can see everything happening. And you're like, well, you're not far enough up here and Onshu's not seeing you coming. He's turning in. And then they made contact in there. And I was just like, oh, the bike started to kick out. The back tire, Fermin's back wheel started to, oh, I was like, oh, no, this is going to be dangerous, this. And the way it flicked him off, he was in the air for ages. Heavy one. But he fucked it again for me. He's just making bad decisions. Joe Roberts having a strop in the gravel trap after his one. Mate, you've killed yourself there. Like... Take your points, go home. It gets me some of these guys. And people think he should be in MotoGP ahead of Ayagura, who's just like level-headed here when he's like, don't panic, just get the job done. Take your eighth place, go home. That's a MotoGP ride for me more than the guy that's like binning it when he's in a decent position. Let his teammate rattle him. Come on, Joe. 
You're better than that, lad. Uh, but yeah, it was this one was a bit chaotic everywhere except for at the front where Jake Dixon controlled the whole thing. So great result for him there. All right, moving on. MotoGP. Let's start with Mark because, I mean, there's not much else to say here. He chopped every session and won. He qualified on pole by eight tenths of a second to second. I mean, I don't know what, I want, what you want me to say. <laughs> it was perfect. It was a perfect weekend. Unbeatable. Completely unbeatable. Um, that's it. I don't know what else to tell you. Nice little return to form for Pedro Acosta. Was brilliant this weekend. Thought the worst after practice and he had to go through Q1. I was like, oh God, he's well off it here. But went through nicely. Had a great qualifying. Got himself in the front row. And Brad Binder was good too. So it marks a bit of an overall improvement for um, KTM. So a nice, I mean, I, I question whether it was going to be a return to form proper after Austria because they are just, it is kind of their circuit. So it's like, well, is it a return to form or is it just Austria? Return to form, it looks like. Even Jack had a good weekend. I mean, fell away in the race and then ended up getting the uh, penalty. So I think he's only finished 15th. He had two other guys. Did they get the penalties in the end? I think they did, Digi and someone else. So I think they all got drop positions. But finish 10th on the road, Jack. So, I mean, not bad. I mean, he's still behind a Yamaha, which is a bit concerning. But it's not too bad. So a marked improvement for KTM. And Acosta is just like showing a bit of skill there. As I mentioned at the top, surprise result. And I did mention it briefly there for the All Japan Cup. Alex Rins, ninth, And he wins the All Japan Cup this week. 10 points for Alex Rins. He's back. It's good to see him do well. Uh, Fabio... Bank no points today, which has just given a sniff to the likes of, well, second in the All Japan Cup after announcing his, well, we'll call it retirement from full-time racing. Um, but let's be honest, he's probably been moved on. Takanakagami, 51 points now after a second place there. I thought he was going to get it, but Rins just took off at one point in the race and then just ended up having a great race. But Taka finished 12th. Uh, he goes second in the All Japan Cup this week. Joanne Zarco, after a ridiculously good qualifying, gone straight into Q2. Uh, he's finished third in the All Japan Cup. He was 14th on the road. Uh, and he was followed in by Mir. And then Marini was way at the back of the field by a lot. A lot this week. And Fabio, like I mentioned, didn't finish. So the All Japan Cup looks like this. Fabio stays on 79 points, still in the lead. Taka's on 51. Zarco's on 46. Rins goes to 43 with that one, getting himself well clear of the... Rabble behind him being the Repsol Hondas. Mir on 33, Marini on 29, and then obviously Bradle and Remy, four and three points respectively. So tell me what you think of how this is is going. Is Fabio at any risk here? Is this just a one-off? If he DNFs again next week, could be in trouble. But the thing you got to remember is when he is ta- like when he does crash there, he's probably actually going to finish up near where Rins was. <laughs> when you look at his form from Saturday, at a great sprint race. Did he finish eighth? I want to say he finished eighth. He did finish eighth. Unreal. Finished ahead of Peko Banyo. <laughs> now, there was question marks of whether Peko's tyres were a bit dodgy for that one, the way he fell away. But, I mean, who's to say? Who knows? You get this sometimes where, like, a guy will just have an unexplainable disaster. And they'll be like, well, it must. Like, did you just get a dodgy bit of rubber? It happened last year with Martin, if you remember. So, it could be the case. Um, but, yeah, Takanakagami, can he win the All Japan Cup in his retirement year? I always said, Taka, tad underrated. I know he never has won anything or done anything particularly special, but he's just solid. You can do worse than that if you're a shit Honda. Just a guy who stays on and racks up points for you. You're getting a full race of data every week. Like, it's fine. That's all right, that. And he's not ridiculously slow like Marini is. So it's like, why not? He's making the reps or guys look a bit shit, isn't he? Sometimes, anyway. Him and Zarco, to be fair. And so, yeah, that's how we look in the All Japan Cup. Now, the big talking point other than Mark of the weekend... I mean, well, we can mention, like, Martin, second again. If you can't win the race, sometimes a guy's just better than you. This is better than what is happening to Peko when he's not winning the race, right? Just be second. And he even said at the start of the weekend, like, not worry about Mark this weekend. He's going to go win the race. i got to beat Peko. And he has done. And he's extended his championship lead very nicely here. So he goes to 20-odd points. 23 points is a, he's ahead of Peko now. Um, so every time it looks like Peko is so dominant, and you can't touch him, and he's winning four out of the last five Grand Prix or whatever the hell he went on that run, he still ends up 20-odd points down in the championship after a weekend like this. It's just bizarre. He has this self-destruct button, Peko, that as good as he is, he sometimes just goes, well, fucking boom, and yeah, I've got to make up all those points again. And no doubt in my mind, he'll go on another run like that, where he'll, he might not win the sprints, but he'll go and win like four out of the next five or six Grand Prix, and then he'll draw level on points after 
the next four or five rounds. And he'll finally, because Martin will be second or third and winning sprints. And he'll only just make up the difference. And then something bizarre will happen like this again. Now, tell me what you think of this incident, because this is a tough one. This is a hard one to call. Is anyone at fault? Possibly. Tell me how you saw it, because this is splitting opinion. Part of me thinks you almost always have to be like, the guy in front has the line, right? If he cuts across you, you've just got to roll off. Sorry. But you've got to understand when you're riding a motorcycle, when you're turning into a corner and someone's, something's on your outside, and, and this is a point that was made by Alex, you're not looking left. When you ride a bike, if you want to, the best way to get a bike to turn, your bike, the bike follows your eyes, basically. If, if you're looking around the corner, which is what he's doing. You're looking as far around the corner as you can because a bike will follow where you're looking. Like, you've got to look at where you're aiming to exit, basically. You don't look at the apex in front of you. That's where you're looking when you're coming out of the last corner, right? You look around at your exit point and even further. So, like, as you get around the corner, you're looking ahead. And you see that when you watch their heads. It's, hard, it's something that's hard to realize if, if you don't ride. Uh, but that's where you look. And that's the best way to get the bike. The bike follows where you your eyes the bike will follow your eyes right it's the best way to explain it so he they neither of these guys are looking like so there's no like quick like when you're in a car and you can like oh there's a guy on my outside but you the same thing in a car you are looking ahead right you watch f1 drive they'll be looking way ahead but you can quickly check and it doesn't really affect where you're turning if you do that while you're on a bike you don't really do that because it can affect where you're aiming so in that sense, I do understand. Alex at no point is ever going to be looking back to his left to see what's coming from that side. He's got to either commit to that corner or not. By the time a bike gets to about here, can you see that in your peripheral vision? I don't know. It all happens really quickly. What I will say is both of them must have known where each other are in the sense that not, like I said, you're not looking at the other person. So you don't know exactly where they are. But the way that that corner's played out, you know that he's gone wide there for example, Alex has gone wide. So Pekka will know that Alex has gone wide there. So he's taken the line. You know you're in front because you've had the momentum. You know how momentum works. You get a feel for these things. So as you turn in, whilst you know that you might be ahead of him and you're like, I'm going to be the aggressor here. I'm going to take the apex. It's his job to roll out. You do know that he must know there's a chance he's going to be there. So do you leave a bike's width? Just for, for the sake of the championship there, and the fact that you're quicker than him on the circuit, that's why you've caught him. And you've got however many more laps to pass him. Do you just give yourself a bike width there and not make it an issue? I think that would have been the sensible thing to do. Even if you think you're fully past him and he has to concede the corner to you, for the sake of the fucking championship and the fact that you will pass him eventually by the end of the race, even if he holds on for that corner, do you just be sensible and go, I'll leave a bike width on the inside? So whilst I don't think it's, Pecco's fault that the collision occurred. I do think it's 50-50 if you ask me. I don't see how any of them can... I guess track position, you have to give it to Pecco, but it is a meeting of two in the middle. But this is where I'm like, if you're Pecco, championship on the line, you can go into... You've had a bad weekend. You can just take what would have been a third place here, I think, because he's going to pass him eventually. Just by... Even just let him stay ahead of you that corner. Like, who cares? Just give yourself the bike width for the sake of the, the what, 16 points? You Is it 16 points per third? That you'll pick up for just being conservative there. Just do it. It's frustrated me a little bit for him because you know there's a chance, even if it's a 10% chance, that he's still leaving it in there. Also, he's Mark Marcus's brother. You don't get along. He's 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 probably thinking, well, I'm not going to fucking leave it in there. You, if you want to go around me, go around me, but you're not having the apex. You don't know if that's what he's thinking. So for me, it is, I can't, I, I wouldn't feel right punishing either of them. If I had to lay blame, I guess track position, you're ahead. Pecco's ahead at the apex. You'd, I suppose you'd have to say Alex should roll out of that because he knows he's coming across him. You know you've made a mistake and he's going to be slightly ahead of you. It's Now, and then you know if he attacks that apex, he's going to wipe your nose off uh, and then you're going to have contact. So in that sense, it's like, do you have to concede it? Probably. If I had to push black, but I wouldn't feel right punishing either. So for me, I'm leaving it like, as the stewards did. I'm leaving it and I just let them have their squabble in the media conference room at the end because like one, one will blame the other and that's it. We're both going to see it from their perspective. With Alex, 
no championship on the line. His brother is going to be your teammate next year. He's probably going to be a bit feisty with you. I'm just... So I'm not blaming Pecco for the incident, which it was a nasty one, by the way. We can go into that. I'm surprised he didn't get hurt getting trapped under the bike. It was a bit of a, oh, like, look through your fingers type one. So while I, I think you're not, I'm not blaming Pecco for the incident, for the contact, I am blaming him in the sense that it's like, why put yourself in that situation? Like, why have you put yourself there? It doesn't make sense. You've got however many more laps to go past him. You're definitely quicker than him. You've caught him. He's made a mistake. He's probably going to make more mis- mistakes as the tyres wear down. You've got him. Do it Do it at the end of the straight. But like you can easily give yourself two bike lengths there, even if he holds on to that position because you've, you've been a bit too conservative with him. You're getting him by the end of the straight probably because he's going to be out of seat. He's, he's all over the place by that point. He's probably not going to have the right line going into the next chicane, which leads you onto the straight. You can sort of keep him on your inside so that he has to defend and you can do the little cutback thing that you can do. You had him beat. You didn't have to take it on that corner. I'm not blaming Pecco for the contact. I am blaming Pecco for not being smarter. Just give him a bike's width. Give him two. Like, it doesn't matter. You've got him. And that's where I sit on it. While I don't, can't lay blame on the contact, I'm calling it 50-50 or 55-45, which is not enough for a punishment for me. Basically, what I'm saying, I think pecco has been an idiot there. <laughs> I think Pecco's just been an idiot. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? So, yeah, Pecco. What the fuck? But anyway, I mean, there was other good performances all around this weekend. I mean, I can go into it if you like. <laughs> Morbidelli, not, well done. Digi and Bez ended up having a decent result. They were not really anywhere near it all weekend. We mentioned Rins, Taka. Oliveira threw it away early, but he looked like he had great pace. Again, low grip circuits, guys like Morbidelli and Oliveira, always really good on these low grip circuits. They seem to be able to... They must have a nice little feel on the throttle and things like that. Nice trail braking. They're like they can when other when it starts to get a little bit dodgy, other guys are like, well, I'll back it off a bit. They've just got this nice little feel to sort of get it working. That's why you see Oliveira being so good in the wet and stuff as well. So they had good weekends. Again, a couple of these guys ended up with better positions than they should have done because of the incident with Peko and Alex at the end there. But yeah, no touch and mark this weekend. That's all I've got for you, really. We are approaching 700 subs. We're not far off. Make sure you hit subscribe if you enjoy the videos because I'd like to just get there soon. You know, it'd be nice to cross the 700 threshold as quick as we can. So thanks again for watching, everyone, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. The races are coming thick and fast now. I've got like seven Grand Prix in like nine weeks or something. So they're coming one after the other. We'll get these videos out. We'll be firing these videos out all the time. So uh, yeah, enjoy this hectic run of races we've got coming because it's always great when it's like that. You just turn on TV every Sunday. There's a bloody race on. It's great. So yeah, we'll see you after the next one. Take it easy.